firstly, I think it's, it's only right to start um, a panel by letting you guys introduce uh, yourselves to, to the panel. So, Stephen, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I'm Stephen Smith. I'm the CEO and founder of Kitman Labs. Um, prior to founding this company, background in sports medicine and strength conditioning, and spent my entire career working in professional rugby and spun this company out of the uh, con concepts and ideas of uh, what I experience every day working in professional sport. Hi, I'm Vossa. I'm uh, head of analytics of IAX, which contains both um, data analytics, which can be for recruitment or game analysis, player analysis, but also video analysis, because we uh, believe that um, a lot of the data um, outcome that we have, it still needs to be translated to players. And the best way to do that is still to show them images. So we have the whole workflow from automating uh, video analysis, as well as um, showing all the outcomes back to players, staff, trainers, board, um, back in image, as well as uh, figures. Amazing. Andre? Hi, my name is... Yeah. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. My name is Andre Oliveira. I'm, uh, I'm f come from Portugal. I'm a medical doctor and also head of performance and medical department at Shuru Praia. We are, uh, we hope, mid-table club in the first division for a very long time. and. Uh, hopefully we can uh, progress on this and the way we go about it, especially in our club. Uh, we try to have a culture of work and physical performance and enhancement. And with that, from a few years now, we have trying to work more and more with data so we can optimize the way we approach things with the limited resources we have. Okay, well, we're going to start with probably the biggest question. I want to ask each and every, uh, each of you this question. I speak to a lot of young players in the game. They're trying to find clubs at times, and they say, I need to get my stats up. I need to get my data up. I need to get this better. I need to get this better. Stats, data, stats, data. This question here, how important is data in football and, and sport today? Want me to answer the question? Yeah, well, well, I hope everyone has yeah, an answer to this. How important is data? I think it's data? interesting what you say, because it always surprises me that uh, football players are not into their data that much yet, so they more tend to listen to what the coach has to say about it, or they, I mean, they do look at their stats if you hang them up in a dressing room, but it's not that they come to you that often saying, okay, I'm, I'm looking for a different club, what would be a good fit, or do you think that the pricing that they put on my head is, is right, or, or all the things that we do have information on. So I do feel like in football it's less known for the players compared to other sports. Um, on the other hand, they do see that it, it, it is used by the decision makers a lot, so they do care about it, but not on a personal level, I think. No, I, I think it's misunderstood at this point in time. I think, um, you know, I, I think part of the issue why we, we have players today that don't buy in, or organizations or coaches that don't buy in, or ownership groups that don't buy into data is that we haven't taught them how to yet. I think, um, you know, we have to help them understand what this information means. I think what we've seen over the last 10 years is a huge explosion in the amount of data being collected across this industry, but I think we have a huge lack of intelligence. I think there is a massive void in terms of people understanding what the information actually means, how do we use it, and how do we use it for multitudes of different use cases. And I think it's only when we start to, to do that and provide that interpretation that we'll really have a breakthrough. And I think that's when players will understand what it means and how to leverage it and why it's important and coaches and ownership the same. How do you do that, Stephen? How do you go about doing that? Because I think that is, I hear what you're saying, but it's quite a big task to get you know, people on board. There's so many different elements of data, whether it's, it's, it's the team doctors, it's the physios, or it's the players and it's, it's stats and data from the pitch, or it's the CEOs that have data on certain players. How do you, how do you go about you know, achieving that task of making it easier to, you know... I think you, ha you, you have to have a strategy. I think um, what we've seen historically is that clubs have oftentimes been really fragmented about how they approach the use of data. So, you know, they'll hire a sports scientist and they believe we have a sports scientist now, we're using data. Or, you know, they're collecting data in one area of the, the organization. I think the entire organization is not connected around that. They don't know what the biggest questions that they're trying to solve in is. They don't know the outcomes that they're trying to support. And I think what clubs have to do, and the clubs that are really successful using data today, have a core strategy around what they're trying to do, the problems they're trying to solve, the questions that they're trying to answer, and therefore they know what types of data they need to answer those questions. They can instill the right processes to ask the right questions, to analyze the data correctly, and then they can actually implement process changes that, that drive that forward. And it's, it's only when you can do that, you have that kind of that feedback loop to 
take all of that, take all of that information, answer those questions, feed that back to everybody else, and then allow the organization to, to move on and improve. So is it important for clubs to use the data model going forward when it comes to whether it's finding a new player, talent, identification, whether it's you know, looking at a young player's stats and numbers? Is it important that we go down that data route instead of maybe some, what it used to be, I suppose, back in the day, the eye test as well? well that's the argument we normally have when we're on our channels when we talk, it's more from the eye. But would you prefer, would you say it's a data is what we should be aiming for to going forward when it comes to everything, talent identification, like I mentioned before, and bringing young players through? I think you have to use each method where it's best for it. So if you want to quickly screen 2,000 players, whether they're in your price range, age range, uh, whether they would be a fit for the team, I would rather do that on data because that gives you sort of the first filter. Um, if you're looking for very uh, specific, especially defending stats, looking for things that could have happened but did not happen, then I would definitely trust the eye maybe better than, uh, than even the best model uh, for a player uh, uh, recruitment. So it really depends what you're after and be very honest about what data can do and what it can't do. Well, when it comes to talent recruitment, I don't have a much say in it. If I, if I did, maybe some of the players, I would not choose them. <laughs> That's a different question. <laughs> no, but what we try to help is um, we, what we do, we, in the studio, we don't have the, it's different, we have only two teams, so under 23 in the first team. So we don't have access to academy and developed players. So t what we try to do, and the model that has been working for us, uh, is we try to see the leaves that the fall off the tree of the big clubs, and that by some reason the, the scouts identify them as having uh, good skills and possibilities of being developed. And then on a span of two to three years, we try to develop them. And that's where we put most of our efforts in. And com going back to your first question about the players, I have a slightly different uh, vision of it, uh, at least in our club. With the culture we've created, the, the players do look a lot to data, which sometimes is not good because they might look too much, especially GPS data. Because uh, we have live GPS, they know we are tracking the, the training like uh, on the go. So they always want to see how they perform and they have to, to tell them that it's not because you've had a high training output that you're tra you train well or not, that's not up to us. But uh, we try to show them that we try to help them with data and they see especially the players who are with us two to three years, the evolution and they have players that they know that went through the same process and now are in big clubs in the Premier League or in the national team or whatever it is. Uh, so they do have that in every, almost everything we do, we have data feedback, so even in gym and stuff. So they do want that a lot, sometimes more than they should because they should focus on playing, you know. How have you seen the development as like the head of medical uh, club? How have you seen development from, from when you probably started to now being at the club when it comes to using data? So, in terms of the experience I've had, I have been in Sterling for six years now. So I've, at the time, we, we changed owners to uh, American owners more, and they were very much into data. So we had that switch into performance. Uh, and so we could see the, the way that w that was implemented. And at, in the beginning, um, this is something no one really cared about, to, to, to be fair. And in terms of data, especially centralizing data was something that we had to, because when I started, like each and every person in my department had their own infos and their own documents in their own laptops. So if someone went away or if something happened to the laptops or whatever it is, we had no information. And for me especially, medical data is very sensible, so we shouldn't have that uh, flying around and uh, people can have access to it. So centralizing everything in a platform was something that was very good for the club. Uh, and we as a club, we don't all also, we don't just develop players and sell them, but fortunately enough, a lot of the staff that's been working with us has gone and go to bigger clubs and bigger opportunities. So I think it's good as well when the staff leaves that the process can keep going because everything is indoors and you can keep that tracking and you can have access to the data before you were there, after you were there, and that's very important for the club especially. Well, so I want to ask you the same question. Have you seen you know, a development and the change from since you've been in your role, obviously you're here at Ajax, in using data and how serious it's been taken as well? When I 
um, joined IOX, this is 12 and a half years ago, <laughs> and then um, people said that data was a trend, like a lot of things we try it over time with cooling or doing ice packs on your head or whatever weird thing we were all trying with, with athletes over time. Data was this new weird thing, so we really had to prove that it added value. Um, so yes, there have been a massive change. Um, I started back in the day with actually some a guy I see in the, in the back, Tom Stevens. Um, with, in Ajax, when we only did player tracking, and the first thing that we always heard was uh, the players performed bad because they were not fit. So we thought, okay, if this is the main excuse for not performing well, then just look at the fitness, see what they did, see what it takes to be fit, and try to align it as good as we can. So basically, it started in um, uh, performance, like um, uh, fitness performance, and from there we more and more questions came up and nowadays we have a team of 22 analysts uh, both embedded in a team as well as sort of an um, a, an engine in the back with data scientists data engineers um, and we support uh, decision making throughout the club so that's that's recruitment it's medical performance it's the technical staff it's on a, a players level um, and so of course still fitness so it it's, it's a lot of areas and also decision making on uh, which youth players are going to break through or how much money should we spend on uh, pl like letting players go and, and, and uh, um, advertising them to different um, um, uh, leagues. So basically every, everywhere, but it's just centralized in one sort of knowledge hub within the organization, which is... Yeah, a big change from where we started. How is it centralized then? Is it used through a company like, I know Kit, Kitman Labs as well, I know they centralize a lot of data. Is, how do you guys centralize? Because it is a lot of data you just mentioned from a lot of different areas within a club. How do you keep it all central within IAX? Well, that's why we need this engine of data engineers knowing how to um, really plug new data sources in. So it can be manually inputted data in um, systems like Kitman Labs, but it can also be um, an API coming from a different data provider. Um, so we have sort of a, a back architecture. architecture um, and yeah, it's everyone I think at some point thought everything needs to be inserted in one system where we now will see that different systems have different qualities and we want the um, end user to be very um, fun of the system that they have to use on a day-to-day -day basis, but in the back, we want to be able to connect all those systems so that we still have all the information uh, collected around a player or a team or a coach. So that's something we do in the back, whereas uh, end users, they only like insert one system, so that's a little bit of the architecture that we have in place. Stephen, I want to ask you, and um, whilst you might be able to help with this as well, the, how do you collate the data in a sense of what are the clubs using nowadays to do it? Because back in my day, it was just a tracker, it was the vests and that, and maybe a bleep test that gave us our scores and we just worked out who was fit from that. But nowadays, what is there available to, to get the, you know, the best use of, of the data from these players and clubs? Yeah, I think the, I mean, the vast majority of organizations today are using a, like a, a myriad of different solutions. So whether they're GPS trackers that are being used in, in practice, and whether it's like optical trackers that are being used in game, or whether it's you know devices, medical devices that are testing things inside in like the treatment room, or whether it's you know performance you know devices and testing systems that are used inside in the gym. Um, I, I think you'll you'll go to different organizations and see completely different sets of providers based on either people's personal preference or based on a specific focus that they have in, in a club on a particular area. So, you know, there's some clubs we work with that really believe in, you know, heart rate data and are collecting way more heart rate data and they're looking at a lot of hormonal markers in, in association with heart rate information and they will go to other organizations and, you know, they'll have a, you know, a, a completely different, you know, uh, focus. I think, the, the, the reality is, and most, most people here that are involved in sport will understand that there, there is no one size fits all, right? There is no, this is what every club should be collecting, these are the types of data that you should be collecting. It should be based on the goals of the organization, what they're trying to achieve, you know, what their game plan and tactics and strategy look like, the composition of their, of their squad and the types of players that they have. And it, you know, I think every organization needs to be really strategic about how and what they do with the information they're collecting and, and why that becomes meaningful. I think one other thing that we've seen change a lot over the last number of years is 
the shift from you would have a new coach who would come in and say, okay, these are the tools that we would use, and then the next coach comes in and says, these are the tools that we would use. I think we're seeing really smart ownership wipe that model away and realize that this investment that they're making in different types of technology and different types of data, if you lose that or you change that every two years or every you know, one year in certain clubs as coaches move in and move out, you lose a huge amount of intellectual property. Um, I think so really starting to be strategic about the types of providers, the types of data and the longevity of that to ensure that the investments that you're making are actually paying off and you're getting consistent data that actually allows you to be able to tell a, stor a story over a long period of time is, is becoming hugely important. Stephen, you have a lot of big clients um, through Kitman Labs. Are you allowed to say who you think uses the data the best, or is there a certain you know, division that you think uses it best, or a certain club you think uses it very well in, in your mind? Anyone that kind of comes, springs to mind? Yeah, I think there's lots of organizations that are, are very good in, in specific ways and specific areas. And we, we also work across a, a lot of different sports. So it's not always just like football. For example, um, you know, we work across the NFL, we work across you know, the National Basketball League in, in the US, we work across professional rugby. And I think what you find is that either in different countries or different sports that people excel in different areas. So we see that in, in rugby, I would say a lot of um, the rehab and recovery side of things are actually really, really good because the sport's so traumatic. But then if we go to, you know, sports like, you know, I think in, in soccer, I think we do an incredible job at, um, I'm not use soccer now because I've been living in the US too long, but in football, <laughs> we, uh, you know, I think we see a, a lot of really, you know, great information being collected around the nutritional side of things, about the blood and biomarker side of things. About, I think we use GPS data a, a lot better in, in, in this sport. I think we go to things like baseball, we see their ability to use in-game data for scouting and recruitment purposes probably unrivaled anywhere else in the world. So I think it just, it really depends on the environment. But I will say what we are seeing more and more often now from uh, professional football clubs globally is that they are starting to see <laughs> The, the, the value of the data and information is becoming so ostensibly important that we're starting to see a, a lot more big thinking from clubs who are saying, okay, we don't want to just be good at tactical analysis. That's not where we want all of our eggs in our basket around that. We want to be excellent in the use of data across every part of our organization. I think the valuations of football clubs today has attracted a, a whole new wave of very intelligent ownership groups that come with money from very successful organizations in other areas of business. And I think that is actually bringing in a lot of really intelligent individuals who are trying to take best practice um, from other industries and then bring them to sport. And I think that that's been, I think that's been a really positive force. Yeah, and it's a big difference because I think that sort of anchors the vision in the club rather than sort of trying a few people who try this new stuff out and people are a little bit hesitant in using it. It's now basically um, yeah, part of the philosophy of the club that they want to monitor what they're doing, evaluate outcome, uh, reconsider their decisions, and then make better decisions for the future. So I think that's, that's something that, that changed a lot over the last few years with new, bigger owners coming in, I think. Yeah, it's been a huge organizational change, I think. And now what we're hearing, like the, and I think this is a really good thing, we're getting a lot of feedback from clubs today who want more insights um, and for their ownership or they want more insights for their executives. They're starting to ask really smart questions like what is the return on investment that we're getting from these athletes? How can you show us for the money that we're paying that we're getting enough availability, that we're getting enough output on the field, that we're actually they're driving commercial gains for us? I think that they're exactly the types of conversations that we should be having because it's a business. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you're, you're right. So the, my mind went to a lot of players that from back in the day when we used to play football, like people would like to stay out extra, do extra training for hours and hours. But now it feels like certain times when I speak to certain sports scientists from clubs in the UK, they say sometimes they have to pull the, the players back in because they don't want them to overexert themselves. But are you saying that it's right to listen to what the data is telling you instead of, you know, back in, like I said, back in the day, we'll be outside for hours trying to do extras and trying to perfect something, but it's better to save the player because the data is telling you to do so? I think it's about using the data for way more than just, than just topics like overload. I think Voss has already mentioned it as well. Like, their, their club have, you know, IX have become pervasive in their use of data for like lots of different business reasons. I think when we think about, you know, uh, the first thing people go to is how do I use it to win a trophy? Well, guess what? Like one team in the league is going to win that. 
not everybody can do it, and not everybody has like the opportunity to actually get there. So, you know, for them, I think it's about understanding like if you're spending millions and millions of pounds on like players, are we actually getting a return from that? Is that helping us? Like maybe we can't win a trophy this season, but what do we need to do over a four, five, six year period? And for some clubs, we know that winning a trophy is not the goal. Actually, being a mid-table te team is a goal because they don't want to spend the same level to compete. Sometimes the goal for them is actually about things like talent development. They want to be selling players. So then the question becomes like, the most important question is not things like load management. It may, be, it may be more important for them to understand what parts of their coaching curriculum are actually delivering the highest yield or for them to understand what what attributes are being paid for in the transfer market? I think I think Stephen is describing my own club a little bit there, <laughs> because our goal, obviously, we we all like to win trophies, and we came close this season in a cup, which is easier sometimes than on a regular competition. But I think uh, what is important, uh, yeah, it's a business, and we have to you have to know like what the, what the main goal is, where you work, and the way. But in football, at least in my vision, uh, well, our model is a lot of developing players and selling them and uh, going and finding another players to develop and sell them. And the best way to do that is to win and to have success, like sporting success. And one of the main things we use the data for, I think, is to enhance availability because from what we have seen, the more the player can train, the better he will become and the more available he is for the coach who is hopefully the guy who can make him better to develop him and has more time with any if there's been data published on that the, the players who obviously some of them are really talented and then have serious injury problems but in the majority the players who are more constantly available for training are the ones who then exceed more and this is also what we see and this is how we try and use the the data and this is where also you have to have the buy-in of the player where he sees we are working for them and not against them um, and so that's, I think, it's the the, the culture you have to, to create. I'm, I'm a really fan of, of this because it's, I once heard someone say the culture is what happens when the leader's not there. And this is what you want to, to have in a club. If everyone goes away, the club stay. It's a practice that is so well uh, suited for them that's given results that even if everyone, everyone goes away and let's left leave the players in the gym and see what they do. I think at this point in the surreal, they will do a good job and they know what to do. And I think that's where you feel the most proud of the work you do. Well said, and if you wanted to say anything, any words on kind of what we're speaking about on this topic. Yeah, I'd just like to add on what you were just saying and basically what you started with is, um, is, the, is the data now the leading thing or should we still trust our eye? I think it's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, and especially because more and more new analytics techniques get added, right? Especially with AI now, all of a sudden, there's a whole new world of things that is possible now and in the near future, even more so. But I think one of the, the fun discussions at the moment in data analytics in football is how much do we trust each opinion coming from head of scouting, uh, a data uh, dashboard, uh, a head coach, a player's opinion, uh, an agent. And I think that what happens now very often is that we say it's either someone's opinion or it's the data, and the data is always objective. Whereas what you see with models, if you train them, the way you train them, there's a lot of subjectiveness in the models as well. But because a lot of a uh, large extent of people in boardrooms, decision making uh, areas, they're not so familiar with using data yet because it's still quite new. They're also afraid to ask those questions. So they see this. Have you felt that in your? Well, way? I see this all the time everywhere. Not only in Ajax, but basically in every club uh, that I visit, and every every panel discussion, every um, uh, summit that we go to, it's. It's now to the point where everyone talks about using data all the time, and it's like, oh, we use the data, so we're always right. Whereas we're actually quite afraid to ask the question, okay, so it has a green um, uh, explanation mark saying this player's amazing, and it has a 0.5.2 outcome. And then everyone goes, ah, oh, yeah. mm, he must be really oh, good, the data says so. <laughs> and they're too afraid to ask the question like, can you actually explain that? And with these more complicated models, we're like, yeah, we cannot 
completely explain because it's an unauthorized machine learning model that blah, 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 blah. But we're still going to make a decision. Are we going to buy this player, which is 20 million, yes or no? So we might as well explain that number in the greatest detail to all the people in the room who have their own opinion and, uh, and, and ability to evaluate players. And I think that at the moment, we're so sort of all into this buzz of we're using AI in our decision making and all these numbers that we're too afraid to have the discussion. What is it actually telling us? What are the blanks? And what do we still need to investigate more or have someone's opinion on who has a lot of experience? And I think that's, that's an interesting thing that we're, we're all facing. No one has the real solution, but it's, it's really definitely something to consider when these discussions come up. Yeah, I, I think data obviously has a lot of hype and everyone Everyone wants to be on that train. And there's a sentence which I really like, which is not mine, so I'll not take credit for it, but it's like, data is like teenage sex. So everyone talks about it. No one knows how to do it. Everyone, everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So they say they're doing it as well. And I think that's, because you can see you a lot of- You should have that. You should have said that. It was, it was, it was my saying. You should have kept Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not mine. No. <laughs> data will prove me wrong. It's not my sentence. But uh, I think, because, uh, for us, we are a small club. We, we have very close contact with each other, and uh, the first question that pops up when we lose a game or whatever is, "How was the data? Can we explain the outcome by the data?" And a lot of the times, I think we can. And we, one of the things that having a lot of data and centralized data enables you is to look back. I think it's the best use we can have on data, it's especially when you have an injury or something. But we got to the end of the season, and we, we do look back to see our matches with the highest output as a team uh, or as individuals, whatever it is. And f for example, this season we had a very sp interesting data, which was, because the, the coaches always think like, if you run more, you win more, if you run less, you win less. But we had the three most demanding matches and the three less demanding matches physically. Uh, there were three games, uh, one win, one draw, one loss. Uh, the win was against the same team in the most demanding match and also the least demanding match. The draw was against the same team, so the, one of the most demanding and the least demanding it was a draw. And in losses we have had matches where we performed really well, physically speaking, uh, and others we don't, but I think that's also due to the team selection, because I know the team, I know if, we, if I wanted to do a match with a very good output physically, I know which players I would choose, because I know which players perform better on that sense. But just to see that it's very hard to predict, like if you watch the, the GPS data without watching the game, it's very hard to predict if we win, if we, if we lose, or if we had a draw. Mm. So I think coaches have such difficult difficulties when it comes to it, because I'm an Arsenal fan. I've seen Arsenal dominate <laughs> games, dominate the ball at times, and then we don't always get the result. And it feels like we're working so hard in you know, keeping our shape and whatnot, but sometimes it's not always about it. It's obviously the, the final score, but the data will show they worked so hard in that game but didn't get the result. Stephen, I need to kind of ask you, I know it's not, we've done a lot about football and talk about football, but you said there's loads of other sports that you work with. Do you still feel the blockages when it comes to data from other sports as well, and football as well? Do you still feel that? Because you began, boss, by saying there was a trend, there was a trend word, data. Do you still feel like there is that, you know, there's, there's, there's blockages when it comes to the mindset of using it in other sports as well as football? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> that's the world over, right? Back to the, the, how we started this, I think um, there's a lack of understanding today. And I think that we have to build a language of performance. And I think it's on us as, you know, either practitioners that are working in sport and working with data in sport, or us as, as technology company who are helping to provide in sport, we have to do a better job. I think the focus over the last 10 years has been, how do we collect the highest quality data? But I think what we have to do is like do a way better job of contextualizing that, a way better job of the interpretation of that, simplifying that. And I think we can't expect coaches to be data scientists, nor should we, and we don't want them to be. Like they're excellent at what they do because they understand the game, right? And they have like they have a like you know a footballing brain, right? And they they know how to read the game and like those things where they say like you know we can see that they they can see the player playing. We have to do a better job of understanding well, what does that mean. Like, tell me more about that, and start to understand well what traits are they seeing with their eye because they understand the game that we can then relate back to the data so that we can actually help them to understand how to how to actually onboard it, how to leverage the information. Uh, I I think that's our responsibility. Or else I think if we don't do that, we'll be sitting here in another ten years and we'll still be sitting here saying these guys don't know how to use it. 
Yeah, that is um, it's a big task, but I think you're right in the sense of how to make it work. I want to ask you about the future of data. I know you briefly mentioned AI, and I feel like that is a topic that I'm quite fascinated by. But from each and every one of you on the panel now, how do you see the future of data going in the chosen sport that you want to speak on? Well, I think um, data is easy to, to get nowadays, so we'll have more and more data. You can have data on everything. Uh, but uh, to me, it's like when the cell phones started, they were big, and then they got smaller and smaller and more efficient. So I think the key is to, to try and single out what are the metrics that really drive your decision, and don't be distracted by others that, because they don't, they don't add anything. You never make a decision based on a, that key point. And I think that's the, the goal, is to find, find more and more, to have a deeper look, deeper understanding, like Stephen was saying. Uh, I think the more open source it is, the more uh, collaboration there, there is I in between uh, stakeholders, because it's, the, it's, not what you, it's not information, it's what we do with it. So I think, for me, it's to have like more sensible data which, you know, if that one is off, it means that you should really do something about it and not just like, oh, okay, he slept six hours yesterday, he slept seven, what does that tell me? Or whatever it is, because we have data for everything. And for me, that's where we need to progress, especially uh, clubs like the one I work with and uh, the ones uh, that have been talked about here as well in other, other talks. It's like, if you have unlimited am amount of resources, either human resources or money, you can spend time, you can spend money on things that then you get to the end and say, yeah, this didn't work. But for us, is to have everything more efficient. That's the way we can then compete with the, the other clubs that can do everything. Uh, so for me, I think that's the, the next step, is to have more, less data, but more precise. I think the, the use of AI and other um, analysis methods were gonna make a huge difference. However, the question A good difference, or...? Like a huge difference. Yeah, in, in a good way, or more... And, uh, well... Or do you depends what you think is a good way. <laughs> um, but I think the question are gonna, still going to be the same, right? Like, how do we win games? How are we going to uh, sell and buy players in the most effective way? Um, how are we going to engage fans? So, the questions will be the same, just the methods will be very different. And I think it will be the same as when everyone was talking about big data, right? I, I used to do talks on big data and football. Um, but it's the question that you have in the morning is still the same. You want to be in time for work, so you're going to check Google how the traffic is. You're not going to say, I'm going to use big data with an AI algorithm with, uh, which is self-learning uh, to check whether I'm going to predict what time I'm going to be at the office. You just say, I'm going to Google if I can have another coffee and leave in 10 minutes or I have to go now. So we're gonna embed it in our way of working and this will go sometimes slowly, sometimes more rapidly. And I think the thing that us as analysts um, and, and uh, people that make the analysis possible um, have to do is try to stay on top of that wave that's coming and try to be able to explain how we can use it in our day-to-day -day decision making so we can actually make better decisions. Are we gonna have the coffee or are we gonna leave now to be in time? It's a big decision in the mornings, I must say. I have the same thing. Stephen, so the future of, of data for you and, and AI, do you see it yeah. you know, pushing? Um, I think I'm gonna agree with, with Vasa again in that I think AI is, is going to make a massive impact. But I think the explainability of that is the most important thing. If you think of the gravity of some of the decisions that we're making, right, you've already mentioned, like if we're going to buy a player, we're going to spend 20 million pounds on that player. That's a big decision to make. <laughs> and whilst AI has a role to play in that, if we can't explain why we're making that recommendation and why you spend that, that money on this player versus that player, that's, that's a huge, you know, that, that, that the gravity of that decision is enormous. Similarly, when we think about things like retain release decisions, you know, if we, let an, if we let a player go because some AI model is telling us that that player is not going to be good enough and that turns out to be the next Ronaldo or the next Messi, that like everybody is like scared to death of like that, of that type of outcome. Or if we're making a decision about some player's health and we put them on the field and they end up getting broken and a career is ended, like the, the gravity of these decisions are enormous. And I think that if we cannot explain what it is that we're seeing and why it's important, then we shouldn't be in the jobs that we're in or we shouldn't be doing it, or we should take more counsel or we should learn more. So education and, around, around. And then the question is like, who's responsible? Because if it was the algorithm, 
it's not that, okay, so if it's, a scout, if it's a Google. scout who tells you he's a good player and he's not, then you say, okay, if he did that five times, he's not such a good scout, we're not going to renew his contract. Yeah. If, if the algorithm tells you bad things, it's not that you're going to lock up the computer in a closet and be, be, be mad at it. Naughty corner. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is really, like, who's responsible if, if, if the algorithms are, are um, the things that you're basing your decision on in the major uh, part? Yeah, we need to educate people about confidence levels as well. So, like, if a model tells us something, it may tell us that, hey, we're 80, it's 85% confidence. That still means 15 times out of 100, the decision is wrong. And I think people need to understand that. So, that in that scenario, we're looking at a model for a retain release decision, and a Messi gets dropped 15 times. Like, that, that's, that's still a real scenario. That's still a real possibility. And I think we have to understand, again, when we're, when we're talking with coaches and we're talking with academy managers or people like that that are making these decisions, we have to be able to give them that understanding to say, this is how confident we are. But there's still, <laughs> there's margin of error. I, I, I'm, I'm worried. I, I'm worried about the fact that, again, like you just said there, so it's a margin, small margin for error, but then who do you blame if they get it wrong? And it is a big decision. And I think the people in clubs, it's going to take a lot to sway them, to trust in, in this data and going forward. Because again, yeah, picking a player to stay or, or be released from AI, if a, a robot told me, I don't know if I can trust that. But I suppose that is what the future is. And I think education, like you've mentioned throughout this whole, whole panel conversation, is, is important. But yeah, it's the confidence levels as well. But it's the way, it's the way it's going. The way, it seems like it's the way that a lot of sport is going, is trusting data and, and, and that and making big decisions. It's just, I'm worried. At this stage, I'm not even at a club and making those big decisions, so I can imagine what it's like for clubs. I am going to briefly just, because we are slowly coming towards the end of this panel discussion, if there's any questions from the audience at all um, around the conversation we've had on, on stage today or, or data, yes, I'm going to run you over my mic. Here we go. Hi, guys. Um, I'm curious about how much of, how many of the clubs are actually investing this data into the women's side? around you know, even menstrual cycles, the impact of performance, recovery, the whole ACL thing. You know, from, from your perspective at, at Ajax, how much of it is actually, is it equal? Um, and then from a Kitman perspective, how much has that investment in data helped the women's, I mean, football specifically, but obviously across the board? So at Ajax, at the first team, we have two and a half video analysts and a data scientist embedded in the team. And then we have our, as I explained before, our engine of engineers and all that. And in the women's team, it's one data scientist and one um, video analyst. Um, and they also get the same support within the team. So it's no different for the women's teams than it is for, for example, the second team who also has one analyst uh, video, one data. Um, so within Ajax, I would say they, they are as well equipped as the men's teams. Um, however, the, um, the bands, for example, that you use for performance are different. Uh, there is different uh, injury risk like ACL, like you mentioned, so there's different physical tests. So the things that we do are not 100% similar, but they're more um, tailored towards the women's needs but the support from the club for that team to get them to the professional level as high as possible, that's the same for, uh, for the women's team as for, for example, our second team. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think from our perspective, we work across the NWSL in the US, so the Women's Soccer League in the US, and also across the WSL and Women's, women's Soccer in the UK. Um, and in both of those leagues, the leagues have made investments to ensure that the, all of the clubs have, there's parity in terms of what they, what they receive. The UK in particular has been really interesting because we've just signed a long-term agreement with the Premier League and the FA as a joint body. And as part of that agreement, they wanted to ensure that all of the services that are being provided are provided to the women's game exactly the same as they are to either an academy or a first team in, in UK football, which is a huge step forward. So I think... Everybody is, I think, is making a conscious effort to invest in the women's game to the same extent. I think where we're missing and what needs to happen is we need dedicated research. Um, there's masses and masses of publications relating to the men's game. And I think what 
women's sport has tried to do is adopt that understanding and then apply those learnings within their game and it doesn't work. The female body is very unique and very different and therefore there's completely different you know, types of issues that they're coming up against and there's completely different impacts to the decisions that are being made. So I think what needs to happen is there needs to be a wholesale investment in like women's specific research to understand the data better and to be able to support female athletes uh, better than we, get, we are today. Any other questions from the audience? Anyone else want to ask a question before we close off this panel? No. Oh, good. Oh, I want to say um, thank you to the panel as well for the, this discussion. It's been very informative, very educational, and it's definitely important to take uh, the data serious going forward, especially in whatever sport whoever sit in the room have chosen to, to have a career in. But thank you all. Thank you all. Please uh, join me in a round of applause for our panel guests. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>